I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is the Tech Central Show, the first of 2024. Welcome. TCS is brought to you by MTN Business. Do visit mtnbusiness.co.za for more information about their products and services. Now, the news earlier this week that Convergence Partners, the investment vehicle controlled by the businessman Andile Ngaba, has acquired Datacentrics, the IT services business that was listed for many years on the JSC and which was later acquired by Alviva Holdings and Delisted. Datacentrics is, of course, one of the longest-standing IT services businesses in South Africa. Its CEO is Ahmed Mohamed, and he joins me in the Tech Central studio now to discuss the Convergence Partners deal. Ahmed, great to see you. Welcome to the studio. Thanks, Duncan. Great to be here. Fantastic. Now, Datacentrics, when was it originally founded? Well, it was listed in 1998 uh, on, on, on the uh, JSE. Uh, but it was formed and it comes from the various tables prior to that. So uh, actually looking at the registration documents, we've got two in, and, and the one was listed in 1998. So mm-hmm. and the other, I think it was 1995. 95. But it had different, uh, comes from the names of Joan Joffe and so on. Ah. Oh. Gerard Ace, Lars Lammers, you would recall. Was Joan Joffe involved in the founding uh, of Datacentrics? She was part of the board. She wasn't involved in the founding, okay. but she was part of the board. Who yeah. founded the business originally? Well, Gerard bought out the, and Gerard and Klaas bought out the operation in Pretoria. Uh, I forget the name of that entity at okay. the time. And uh, that's where it started from. So it was in, uh, in Linwood in the early years. Right, right. I remember uh, traveling 65 kilometers to get to the office in Linwood. <laughs> And uh, listed in 98. Of course, there was a tech listings boom in 1998. We, yeah. uh, South Africa kind of uh, predated or, or um, ushered in the dot-com bubble in a way because we had our own mini listings boom in the tech space in 98. And then the US, of course, had its tech bubble two years later. Yeah. Uh, many of the businesses that were listed in, in that 1998 tech boom, of course, have long gone. Uh, so Datacentrics is, uh, is, 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 is one of the few survivors of, of that time. What has been the key to its... Longevity. I think we've always run the business for the long term. So uh, even when we're listed, despite all the pressures of listing, yeah. we've sort of had the view is uh, you know have uh, strategies that will stay in as good state over the long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there's a, a lot of different things you can point to 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 the success of the organisation over the years. So. Uh, and you're right. I mean, uh, I jokingly said, I think I must be the longest uh, serving CEO of a tech company. How long have you been so, CEO? Uh, I think it's 22 years this uh, next year. You know? okay. it's, oh, it's actually now in January. It's 22 years. Yeah. That's a, uh, so it's a long time. It's but, a good uh, yeah. As I said earlier, <laughs> on, I think it's, if it was any other industry, I most probably wouldn't have been here. But uh, yeah. Uh, the development in technology keeps you on your feet. You've got to yeah. think uh, differently. You've got to be agile and so on. And I think we've built that DNA into the business. And obviously, we've been ethical. So we've taken the brunt of that in the in uh, the last 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, I remember there was, I think it was 2009, where our uh, public sector revenue just deteriorated significantly uh, overnight. Mm-hmm. But we navigated that quite well, and it's uh, stood the test of time. I'm glad to say. It's, uh, I think there's some luck involved in it, Duncan, yeah. to be sure. But uh, our strategies were right as well. Yeah. Well, of course, too many IT companies were caught up in the state capture era. Yeah. Um, and uh, Data Centrics uh, was was name was never came up once in related to public sector contracts. So that's. Uh, yeah, it's always challenging. I mean, as a as an entity, we've never engaged in that. We've walked away from significant deals. Uh, but, you know, given the climate at the time, you always are in the danger of some rogue individual in your organization mm-hmm. doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So we've been very, very disciplined about ensuring we convey the message on a regular basis. And uh, thank God it's uh, stood us in good stead. Good to hear. Good to hear. So uh, t- tell me a bit about how the data centrics business has changed in the time you've been there. I mean, you, you alluded to the fact that uh, technology is always forever moving forward. Um, but um, compared to when you started as CEO 22 years ago, how has the business shifted? And, and maybe take us through a little bit uh, who your customer base is. I think it's a significant shift. Uh, in the early days when I started, there was largely government. Uh, the, the, the Most of the transactions were in the government space and it was really commodity driven you know in the early 90s uh, you, know, you could sell anything in tech so 
you get a faster process as the guys would buy the new notebook or desktop or whatever the case may be. So we, we sold a lot of commodities in, in the public sector at this stage. We had a few commercial clients, but nothing to talk about. And it was largely based on commodity sales. So mm-hmm. uh, I was saying jokingly to some of my colleagues the other day, I remember the time where we sold uh, 12,000 printers in December to a government department. You know, that's the type of deals we're, right. we're engaged in. Today, it's very different. And, and, and we've used an evolutionary process I think we've tried to build uh, the DNA of the organization around what is uh, good for the customer. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, tech today is, is very important in business, but applied correctly, it's important. I mean, applied incorrectly, you start having other challenges. And, and I think the, the cloud bubble sort of demonstrated that, you know, the cloud first strategy, and you mm-hmm. would have been in that. We organizations have, have taken that approach. Our approach is very, very different and, and, and saying what we understand technology and we keep pace with technology. We understand what's happening in the AI space or data space or the digital infrastructure space and, and, and. But it's about how you apply that to derive actual business benefit. Mm. Now, I'm not saying all our engagements are in that format, but there's a significant amount of engagement where it's a consultative engagement, it's strategic. Uh, we've invested significantly in uh, technical capability, solutions architects, you know, the top skills in the market. And, and we are, we have some of the best skills in, in the business. So our people are, are very cool to us. And, and we've nurtured that over the last 22 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of my senior t- uh, leadership team have been, uh, and other members have been with us for 15, 20 years as well. So. Okay. Okay. So the client base today, do you, I mean, it sounds like you've, you've transitioned from more of a, a product box dropping business originally into much more of a services consulting business today. Is that a, a fair description? Absolutely. Absolutely. And our strategy from the outset wasn't to drive a, a acquisitive strategy. I think uh, at the time in, in the early 2000s and mid 2000s, massive acquisitions in this space. And typically what happens is you find a clash of cultures in those businesses. You can't integrate them correctly and mm-hmm. you get also stuff that you don't want as part of the acquisition. Yeah. So we've been very uh, specific about the way we built the business. Uh, uh, strategic acquisitions built on to the business, integrated into the business and ensure that it runs as a seamless engine. So mm-hmm. I think uh, that's that's worked well for us. We, we don't have uh, competing entities in the business like you've seen with some of our competitors out in the market. Uh, when we uh, do uh, a tender or so on, there's mm-hmm. one approach from data centrics and not five. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've honed that in uh, that strategy uh, uh, in, uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, you know, when you engage and a customer engages with a uh, with a data centrics engine, it's a holistic approach in, in understanding your business and then applying the technologies to give you some business value, business benefit, whatever outcomes you're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, tech drives business strategy actually. Mm-hmm. So in in some cases, we in organisations doing that. Uh, have strategic sessions with them on an annual basis, uh, understand where the business is going. We understand where the technology landscape is going because we deal direct with a number of vendors, so we keep pace with uh, who technological are your, developments. Who, who are your most important uh, partners in, in, the, in the vendor market? So we're uniquely positioned. We've got direct relationship with uh, quite a number of the vendors. So the big ones is obviously HPE from a, a technology stack infrastructure point of view. We have uh, Dell and uh, EMC stack, uh, the Lenovo stack. Uh, and that's also been a diversification because historically we only had one vendor. Today we have all the major OEMs and we're highly accredited so in the top tier mm-hmm. echelons of those. And we have an engine that imports directly and right. configures uh, you know, ships uh, throughout uh, both SA and, and Africa where, where we follow our customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you look at the, the history of the organization, we've gone from a box drop to building out a business that is actually uh, rich in skills, rich in capability, uh, with a view of saying to a customer, you know, what are your challenges and how do we apply technologies to navigate those challenges? Uh, and I'm not saying every engagement is like that. Some are sure. tactical. They come and say, okay, they, they need... Um, you know, they need a network solution. In, but even in that, there's complexity. As, yeah. as much as technology is becoming easier, it's also becoming more complex in the way you design and deploy. 
Which are the most important industries that you service? Um, what are the biggest ones? Yeah, I think I think the positioning of of entities as far as segments are concerned, uh, we play across the segment. So mm -hmm. if you look at the digital infrastructure space, whether it's cloud or any of the other technologies, they're fairly generic. Yes, you know, in in application, even AI technologies. So. You know, it might apply to a different data set, but the way it works and functions is fairly generic. So mm -hmm. we operate uh, in the financial sector, in the mining sector, in the agricultural sector, education. It's across the board. Uh, across the board. And uh, we have started honing in, particularly when it comes to digital solutions, uh, into sectors. So, mm -hmm. you know, the agricultural applications uh, are different, though the underlying technologies and infrastructure is the same, but the, the applications that you run on AI and the way you assimilate information and uh, produce that for for those environments are different from the mining, they're mm -hmm. different from... So we have uh, what we term as endowments, which is uh, annually, you know, whether it's education or mining mm -hmm. or, you know, a, a number of these sectors that we, we engage uh, particular sectors in. And you, you said the public sector is business is picked up again? It's uh, starting to pick up. It's, um, you know, we, we think it should be around 30-odd percent of the business. I think that's about the spend of the public sector in terms of total IT spend. Okay. Uh, so it started, uh, and we've done some significant deals in that uh, space. You know, and it's the more complex deals in that environment that we've been able to deploy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are you seeing less of that state capture nonsense now in 2023, 2024? Or is it still going on? I think it's a levels of how deep that is. I think globally it's a challenge, to be honest. Uh, okay. And I think, uh, you know, it's it just depends which entity you engage and where you are. Uh, we don't get sidetracked with those type of issues. And mm -hmm. because we're known as an industry that we don't uh, engage in those type of activities, we will never get approached. So okay. to what extent that is, uh, is still endemic, I don't know. I think it's improved. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, but there's still work to be done, I would think. Sure, sure. So, Datacentrics was listed in '98. It was delisted in 2016. I think it was 2016. Okay, yeah. and that was with the acquisition by Alviva Holdings, which, of course, is the parent, which was also listed at the time, yes. the parent of um, Pinnacle and Axis, two big distributors in South Africa. Correct. How did that acquisition come about, and what was the what was the thinking behind it? Yeah, it's a quite a complex uh, situation, but uh, when we did a transaction for B purposes in 98, I guess, and there was a top-up tranche uh, later in later years, uh, as, as you would know, these the way these uh, BE transactions are structured, uh, sometimes it doesn't pan out that the BE companies sit with all of that, so it goes okay. to other the funders that, uh, and so on. So. Uh, it ended up that uh, an, a private institution held uh, a listed company in their portfolio, and mm -hmm. obviously uh, they were sitting with a big chunk of that, about 30-odd percent. And um, someone got a wise idea to uh, to flog this stake around, and that's how it ended up in Pinnacle. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I actually was part of Pinnacle many years ago before oh, really? I started with the, okay. So I ran uh, Pinnacle in, in the early 2000s. Ah. I was an MD there for many years, you know. Ah, okay. So there was, uh, yeah, that's how it rolled out into the So into you knew the guys. Group, yeah. Okay. Okay. So so that acquisition took place. The the business was uh, was delisted. And then, of course, Elviva last year delisted itself uh, yeah. from the JSE. And uh, I presume they have now decided that uh, Datacentrix doesn't fit into their core strategy as a as an unlisted business. So maybe take us through the timeline of, of how uh, Andile and Kaba became involved, how the conversion deal happened, and how Alviva decided. Was it a case of Alviva saying, this is no longer core, let's find a buyer for this business? Or did Convergence come along and say, we're interested in buying this from Alviva, can we do a deal? How, do, how did it actually come about? I think, Duncan, these things are never clear-cut. There's always mm. a combination of factors that uh, comes together that uh, drives a particular... Uh, outcome mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know at the time that uh, Alviva delisted um, uh, I think it was opportune for them to look at the portfolio in a delisted environment uh, we had appetite to take the business out of, of that environment and uh, you know I had uh, discussions with uh, with PSPs and, and, and the board mm -hmm. there um, and uh, simultaneously, I know I'm delayed for a very long time. Uh, I mean, okay. It comes from DD. We've had other discussions. 
Uh, and in fact, it started off with uh, another conversation we had in partnering in, in a particular area, and, and we got to talk about it as Centrix, and, and that's how it unfolded. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, that was almost a year ago that that process started, so I started okay. chatting to him. We had appetite because we've been there for 22 years in, in this thing, and uh, what we didn't want, uh, to be frank, is sitting in another entity where we didn't have control of our own destiny, and, and, and the stars were aligned for this mm -hmm. transaction to happen, so we're aesthetic uh, and, and excited in mm -hmm. terms of what they bring to us. Uh, the knowledge that Andile has is, is significant in the industries, uh, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. we think we can leverage some of uh, their capability in, into our business and, and vice versa. So I think uh, the cultures are aligned, the uh, ethos is aligned, the value system. Uh, and, and, you know, when it comes to acquisitions, uh, in my opinion, is uh, normally it doesn't not work because of the financials. It works. It doesn't work because of the culture fit of entities. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got very strong alignment. I've worked with them for over a year in terms of uh, this uh, uh, transaction or less than a year, sorry, it's not over. Uh, and, and, and we're very, very comfortable with the entities. We, we really work well with them uh, today, too. So is this a private equity type of arrangement? Yes, it is, yeah. It's a private equity yeah. deal. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the uh, CP uh, conversion partners is typically Model, it. Uh, yeah. Though they have a slightly different flavor, I, I sense, and until it's better to speak on it in CP, mm -hmm. but I think they, they focus on the technology space, which brings value to us, yeah. you know. They're also longer-term investors, aren't they? Aren't tr traditional private equity was, invest for five years and then get out? That's exactly what I was getting to, is mm -hmm. that, yeah, uh, I think they take a different view to normal private equities and have a longer uh, horizon in terms of entities out there. Yeah, so they're not going to flip data centrics again in a few years from now. This is a, a longer-term investment for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's any business at the end of the day, I think uh, we may have a certain view, but uh, sure. con confluence of… Uh, Things change. Situations yeah. and circumstances, Michael, but that's it's not bought as a flip now. Mm. Mm. Okay, okay. What is the state of the IT market at the moment? How how are things out there? I mean, is it is it tough, or are things picking up? I know there was a bit of a downturn. Uh, there was a bit of a boom around COVID as people started to work from home, and there was demand on on uh, on solutions around that. Uh, and then there was a bit of a slump, particularly in the hardware space. Yeah. Um, are, are we coming out of that now? Is the market starting to show signs of life? Uh, you know, the, the predictions out there is uh, sort of around, depending which analyst you talk mm -hmm. to, is around 6 7% sort of growth uh, okay. and depending on, the, on the segment. So it is growing at a higher rate than GDP in the, in the market, so there's, there's, uh, there's room for growth there. Uh, given where we position as a business, I think there's room for us to grow and take market share away. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, one is that 7% increase in spend, but the other is also how can we expand into adjacent areas that yeah. will grow our business and, and give us a bigger bigger market share. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, again, I think the convergence uh, uh, you know, partnership now will, yeah. will, will bear us, uh, will, will bring some benefit for us in that yeah. space. Okay. And uh, you, I noticed, noted in the uh, press release announcing the deal that um, uh, one of the things you expected to be able to do is to um, expand your focus on the rest of Africa. Um, how, how will it how will it do that? And will you be working with other conversions partners, investment companies, uh, to to expand your presence on the continent? Yeah, I think I think they've got it right to some extent in Africa. It's a it's a difficult environment to operate it. So we do have an Africa presence. I mean, we service uh, a lot of our customers that have a footprint in Africa. And by the way, we have a Middle East presence as well. Okay. So we've done some work there. Uh, but what we don't chase is business in those particular countries, and uh, and and we want to explore how can we unlock that uh, together with convergence partners, um, you know. And and there may be entities that we can that synergistics that we can add value to them, and they can add value to us. But operationally, obviously, the businesses will remain separate. It's about sure. uh, the leadership and the maturity of how do you bring this together for the benefit of the greater group. Sure. How, how hands-on is Convergence Partners as an investment firm? I mean, will Andile work closely with you in developing strategy and that sort of thing and, and, his, and his leadership team at Convergence, or do they take quite a hands-off approach? That's an interesting question. I guess it will unfold as it unfolds. As time goes on, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, our discussion, uh, Andile and I, is uh, uh, they want to keep it separate. They, they, they like the management team, they like the, the business, they like the ethos of the business. Uh, they're very comfortable with the, the entity uh, and the way it's positioned in the market. Mm -hmm. 
so to the extent that uh, I think where value can be derived through those conversations, we'll explore those. So mm -hmm. I don't think they'll get operationally involved in mm -hmm. the business. That's certainly not. And in fact, he's, 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 uh, I invited him to the staff meeting in, uh, when we announced the uh, mm -hmm. transaction. And uh, that's the sort of message he gave to it. He's got full confidence in the business and it's not... They're not buying a business that they need to fix. They're buying a business in terms of being able to leverage some of their capabilities and driving additional value through that okay. uh, transaction. So, you know, Andila has got uh, significant knowledge. He spends a lot of time in the U.S. in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's AI sort of technologies, develop partnerships that we can develop, we'll ex explore that mm -hmm. as well. But we see in the immediate future some leverage in, in Africa and understanding how they do that and, and how can we piggyback on that. Do you think it'll also open up new clients potentially for the business? Our time will tell. That's mm. not the reason we've done the transaction. I think we've never looked at our shareholders to unlock that value. Mm -hmm. But I guess uh, the gravitas of uh, Convergence Partners and Andile as an individual within that entity will yes. lend uh, some credi uh, better credibility to the organization as well, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would think. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, I don't know if you're in any hurry to uh, to list this business again, or if that was a discussion at all that happened in the in, in the in terms of the transaction with Convergence Partners. But Datacentrix was listed on the JSE for many, many, many years. Is possibility it might return to the boss at some stage? I think circumstances will dictate. I think the question was asked on Dele as well, and 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 that's. It's not a strategy to, uh, uh, and, and not the reason I think Convergence Partners mm. brought it to list it again. Uh, but what happens in four or five years' time will dictate in terms of whether it makes sense against a list or not to list or you know, continue the business and just build it bigger and bigger and into the rest of Africa and globe. Uh, I suppose it really so, depends on market conditions yeah, as well. Circumstances market. will do. So there's no, we haven't gone into the transaction to say we're going to list it in three sure. years' time now. Uh, and I think that's the messaging coming from Andila and it's really more a question they should be answering sure. because they're all 100% of it. But yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. And how how big is the data centric business today? I don't know how, how how much you can disclose about revenue and, and that sort of thing, but but may, maybe some top line numbers and staff size as well. Yeah, we're about thirteen hundred uh, people, uh, largely highly technical skills uh, individuals, whether that's in networking, the digital space, or so, uh, core data center, cloud, and so on. So about a thousand three hundred. We, uh, from a revenue, I can't uh, obviously divulge those numbers, but it does put us in the top five sort of players mm. in the market and, and, and edging away quite aggressively. So okay. our, our strategy is really to target for that number one spot. Uh, though I don't drive the business, for me it's about profitable growth rather than just revenue growth. So, sure. Uh, but yeah. But continuing to eat away market share. Yeah, we're a strong contender in that space. And we don't play in every single area, so we don't do core ERP systems and so on. But in the market, uh, the digital infrastructure space, the digital uh, solutions areas, uh, we have a significant market share in those particular areas that we play in. So and if you look at the vendor landscape, uh, if it's anything to go by, we're always, we've been for the last, was well, probably 15, 18 years, mm -hmm top vendor for HPE, we in the okay. top three for most of the other vendors as well. Yeah, And then we have uh, partners like OpenText that plays in the data side of the business, which is becoming bigger and bigger for us. Uh, and actually, it's an important facet for most businesses is about the data. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, infrastructure is uh, it's like the car and the engine you want to run it, but how mm -hmm. efficiently can you extract the power and the information out of that data is, is what we're focusing mm -hmm. on. So you'll see our messaging has been around data and you know whether that's in the edge or putting it in the cloud, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is the debates we're having with our customers because mm -hmm. sometimes you need that information in the edge uh, to facilitate quicker turnaround times, decision-making processes mm -hmm. and so on, particularly in retail environments and so on. Ahmed Mohamed is CEO of Datacentrics. Thanks for coming to our studio today. Thanks for having me here, Duncan. Great chatting to you again.